Welcome to the Lemonade Stand Stories podcast. Tune in every Thursday as we share inspirational stories from the world's greatest creators, entrepreneurs, and go-getters about how they've turned life's lemons into lemonade. And now here's this week's host, the CEO of Lemonade Stand, Derek Miner. Welcome to the Lemonade Stand Stories podcast. So excited to have Morgan Snyder here with us today. Morgan is a top voice on LinkedIn. He is a copywriter, right? A brand strategist. Bottom line, he writes and people buy is what I understand. But more than anything, we're just so glad to have your voice on our podcast today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. Thanks again for making the dashing through the snow on the way over here. I know. Right? That I was, was <laughs> always it. Always an adventure on the freeway when it's snowing mm -hmm. with crazy drivers and everything else we were just talking about. I wish we recorded like a few minutes ago because we were having an amazing I know, conversation. We were. we were. This one's going to be a little better. This oh, one's yeah. going to be even better. Heck yeah. Um, so really what we want to do is just talking about enduring and overcoming life's lemons that have mm -hmm. been dealt to us. But first, I want to talk about something on your website that I saw. This is memory. Mm -hmm. And I'm super curious. It says grandpa's farm and frisbee golf. Yes. Tell me more. Yeah, so my my grandpa had a farm in Ravenna, Ohio. It's in the Akron area for those that know Ohio, but um, got several acres there, basketball court, a little pond, tons of grass. And so my dad and his four brothers would bring their families every summer to grandpa's farm. And we have this tire set up at Strategic Parts around the acreage. And it's just like a tire. And then there's one by a shed. And then there's one at the bottom of a hill. And so we basically created this like par system similar to golf and um, we, we team up in pairs and, uh, and we just play Frisbee golf. And it is a full blown trash talking affair and it gets real rowdy and you've even got people that are like screaming at you as you go to throw every time and, and it is a wild competition. I mean, I know there's probably a few people out there that do Frisbee golf for fun, but this is like high stakes. Like you come to win every time you come to the farm and and it's it's like the olympics it's like our family's olympics yeah so tell us what happens with the winner and those that either win or don't i'm well, sure that's the, the be winner an interesting the thing. winning parents we do solo as well but the the paired up competition's fun because you always get to take the best throw of the two people so that makes it just a little bit more enjoyable because you if you if you have a bad throw on a hole and then like if you have carryovers and other things like you could completely eliminate yourself from taking home the gold that day and so i like we liked it in the pairs i did at least and that person just gets to walk around talking about how they won the gold medal. We have a mini podium and we have the person that stands up that gets the gold, silver, bronze. Sometimes pictures are taken. And we remember, like my uncles growing up remembered every time that they won. And even like we'd show up at a random reunion and be like, last time I checked, I've got five gold medals around my neck from the last few. And like, there's just always this constant banter. And so not even on the farm, but like at Christmas time, we're talking about Frisbee golf and how we won. And, and, and there's other games too. I mean, we, we play pig, um, we have water wrestling and man, that, that, that's almost even scarier than obviously than the, cause you're in there with the frogs and the leeches and everything else. But wow, that sounds incredible. We're just really competitive and it's ridiculous. All the women go inside. <laughs> like my aunts would just be like, okay, we're playing pig. I'm, I'm gone. Like I'm going to go in and we're going to talk, but yeah, that's the Snyder family. We're just, we're rough housers. We're loud. And on my website, I have all my favorite things, but that's something that's always going to stay with me forever. Um, when thinking about my identity and who I am as a human being is I'm a Snyder and that's, for, for better, for worse, that's what I think about. I think about the games, the friendship, the the times where my uncle threw me in the pond and chased me and I, all all that stuff is, is part of my memory of grandpa's farm. That's incredible. And did you grow up helping on the farm? Um, it, by the time that I was around, it wasn't a full farm. Like they had horses before and some other animals and stuff, but really it was just a pond, a zip line. <laughs> and all the games. And that's, that's what it was about for me and my grandma, like cooking tons of great food for us. And, um, that's, that's what the farm was. So not really a farm, but the, the, up, of just a, a grandkids playground. At there that you point. go. Yeah. That sounds amazing. But you, you grew up in a very musical home. I did. And how has that yeah. affected your life and your career? Oh man. Um, I think when it comes to the performance aspects of what I do, cause everybody's selling it, like you're selling yourself, which I believe is the most important product of, of, of them all. But whether it's a service or however, I feel like you always have to have 
the ability to stand up and pitch something and and sing something. I mean, literally, you're you're guiding through a performance. And um, my mom was a piano voice teacher growing up, and she put me right in the alto section in our church choir. And so from the time I was eight until I graduated at twelve, I was right in between these old ladies, <laughs> Alita Sakash and uh, and and this other woman, and they would be like, "Oh, Morgan, you're not singing that. You need to." Be. And like my mom is the choir director. Like if I'm going to take instruction, it's going to be from her, like not you two old ladies. So um, from that moment on, like I sang in barbershop quartets. I was in punk rock bands. I, I did a, a ton of singing from the time I was very little. And my mom loves to bring this up. Uh, when I was like three or four, she had me. There was a, like a community college solo event. And I was up there singing like Away in a Manger at four it's like, and so from that, from that time, all the way until I left the house, I was just singing. I had to give up piano. I, I caved, I shouldn't have, but I caved and I was like, mom, I'm playing sports now. I'm not playing piano anymore. I'll, I'll sing. I'll do that for you, mom, but I'm not playing the piano. And she was wow. heartbroken. And, uh, so now my, my son actually plays and stuff, but it just skipped a generation. It's still in the family, but I don't play the piano anymore. I hear you. That <laughs> same thing happened in my house. At what age were you like, I'm done with the fifth, piano? Fifth or sixth grade. Yeah. Cause I was like playing football and wrestling and doing like track and whatever else. And said, I, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't like it. It's just not fun anymore. And my mom went off to her room and cried. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing with my dad. He was <laughs> yeah. a concert pianist. I said, oh, dad, man. at 16, I'm done. He's like, okay, choose another instrument and practice an hour a day. So I chose the drums. Oh, and nice. my mom was like, I, she also ran into her room and started crying, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's amazing what, you know, as you talk about pitch, right. Always being ready to perform in one yeah. way or another. I mean, so many amazing life lessons from, from music. Sure. And I was just super curious about that. But then, um, what's really interesting is how you started your career, right? It, yeah. As a Spanish teacher in high school, mm -hmm. which amazing anyone who spends time teaching, you know, in junior high and high school. God bless you. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I always that, say. And yep. then that transition to, you know, to where you are now. Tell mm -hmm. us about that journey and what are some of the experiences that you had that stand out? Yeah, so I, I thought that I was going to be um, a college professor. And so I, I studied Spanish. I studied Portuguese. Some of my friends and I took Chinese. We, we just loved languages. And so we'd go into these classrooms and those poor teachers, like we were totally unafraid. Well, the majority of the students in there it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to make a mistake. But in my Chinese class, I was the most obnoxious student because I was, I was like, I've made a million mistakes learning Spanish. Portuguese is so fun. Like I, I can just go through here and have a good time with it. And so when I got my Spanish degree, um, then I went off to University of Portland and got a degree in second language acquisition. And I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to teach high school. I'm going to coach wrestling. I'm going to do all those things. And then eventually I'll probably go back and get my PhD and and, and uh, be a professor in some way. Um, but as I got into middle school, high school teaching and writing online curriculum and doing all those things and having having kids and trying to figure out what I what's like the actual trajectory of my life. And it's like, I don't really want to be an administrator someday. It just is like, I don't want to chase kids around the school grounds and you know, giving them leadership lessons and trying to get them on the right path. It's like, I don't want to be that. Um, and what was funny is my brothers-in-law all were door knockers and selling alarm systems. And they said, you should just come out and try it. I thought, there's no way I'm going to sell alarm. Like I'm a cool blue, like a B personality. I'm not going to charge into someone's home and be like, this is where you put the sensors. Like I'm not, <laughs> there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. But I actually tried it and I was halfway decent and, uh, knocked doors in Seattle. And what was so wild about, um, the, the door to door sales is like, you just continue to get at it and you approach people the way that you just, you are, and you understand exactly who you are and how you do things. And, um, I remember being on the doorstep with a lady who said under no certain term, like on certain terms, I'm going to buy an alarm system. And there's like, there's no way this is going to happen. And I was like, okay. And we just kept talking and talking. And I said, this is so random. I got to use the bathroom. Like, can I use your bathroom? And she's like, oh, sure. Because at that time we had spoken for like 25 minutes. And so she lets me in the home. Her sister is visiting from Ohio. We start talking about Cleveland. And literally after I got out of the bathroom, she's on the phone with customer service getting an alarm system. <laughs> and I'm like, this is out of control. Like, how am I doing this? And I ended up selling um, three of the neighbors in the cul-de-sac as well with just weird, like one of them, I had a conversation through a window and then he let me in. And then, I mean, just, just continuing to try things like me, like Morgan and not trying to be like the other guys on my sales team. And, 
And then after that, um, I was I was visiting my parents and knocked on the door of a healthcare executive, and we went through this whole thing. And he had an alarm system up in his wall, and the cords were all over the place. I'm like, he's getting an alarm system. He didn't. And then uh, there there goes my confidence. But a year later, he said, I'm breaking away from this huge healthcare organization. I'm going to um, be a consultant. I think you'd be good at it. And I said, oh, okay. So I said yes to that. And we move out to Ohio. I'm with him for a year, learn how to wear a suit and I just look pretty in boardrooms and do stuff with him. And then he goes, I've reconnected with a founder in Utah. It's a healthcare startup. I'd like you to be a part of it. And I said, yes, again, my wife's like, startup, like what is a startup? And I said, I don't know, we're going to find out. So we moved to Utah and I'm sorry if I'm going off on a Morgan monologue here, but it, it's, it's just wild. Like everything that happened was just because I kept saying yes and I kept trying and I kept doing and I had no training and we get to the startup and the founders are like, we didn't bring he you here to raise money. We're in the middle of a fundraise. But, and I just said, this is digital door knocking. This is the same thing. I'm a decent writer. So I'm going to start writing emails and creating mini pitch decks and anything else that I think of that could sell. And um, we ended up raising a really big seed in series A round. I thought, Hey, I can do this. And, and it, it was sort of like that for a, a certain stretch of time where because of my ability to say yes, not because I was like way smart or anything, but just because I kept trying to do things, I just found myself doing it. And it's almost like that um, X-Men character juggernaut, how he breaks through walls with his head. <laughs> like, that's what I felt like is I had no training. Like I would get on calls with VCs or angels and be like, so where did you get your MBA? Don't have an MBA. Oh, okay. It's like, all right, well, who cares anyway? And I would just like continue to talk to them because so much of that world is credentialism and like, oh, where did you go? Who do you know? And it's not about how quality the idea is. And in my mind, that's what it's always been about is the, the quality of the idea and how persistent I can be. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm at a startup and, and people are coming to me and asking me questions about how to bring ideas into the world. And I'm like, I don't know, I have no idea. And uh, I saw a big gap between how people think about their ideas and how they push them out, how they communicate and message around just the overall service or like what the product is or who they are personally. And I thought there is something to this. How can we combine social media, content marketing, website and deliver it as, a, as like a product to somebody? Or if I go to an executive and say, hey, I see this gap in what you do, let me help you. And that's what became my, my writing business a couple of years ago. And so um, I was laughing with Julie, my wife, uh, about this last night, actually, in preparation to come on the podcast is almost 10 years ago, I was sitting in a classroom with 40 freshmen trying to teach them English and, and or trying to teach them Spanish and, and babbling on and on about Picasso and other stuff. And now here I am on this podcast talking about writing. I mean, it's just, I'm like yeah. Mr. Unconventional. Like there's, there's nothing linear about what I, everything is a winding road. But I think in some ways it makes me more passionate and powerful and energetic around the work that I do because I've been there, done that, been miserable Spanish teacher. And it's like now I've found something that I, I can really get behind and, and feel good about when I wake up. That's so awesome. Man, there's so much to unpack from that. And I, I, I love story, that. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, the fact that you the fact that you went out showed up a couple things that I'm super curious about. What did what did that executive see in you? Did he ever tell you this is what I like about you? And oh, it's just my million dollar smile. I I don't I don't think there was anything in particular. I think he just saw that I was very thorough in, in the way that I presented things. And um, going back to my mom, actually, I don't know why my brain's making this connection, but when when you're a performer and you're singing, there's a certain posture that you have. There's a certain way you carry yourself. And I think some of that came out with him. Is he he probably saw that just the way that I was able to speak, communicate and lead conversations. He thought maybe this Morgan guy's got something to him and I can mold him because yeah. he's a very, very raw piece of coal and I'm going to change him into something else. But no, that's awesome. And the fact that you walk in there and build a relationship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so one thing is just relationship that you were able to establish in relatively short order, really through the power of how you showed up Yeah. and the words that you used. Mm -hmm. Right. And words have a lot of meaning and I'm sure to you, they're even everything. more. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about that and what words mean to you and how you show up to use those to build relationships and tell incredible stories. Yeah. I think, I think the number one and Merriam Webster just came out with this thing about how authentic is their word of the year. Authentic, like just being, and 
we're all, if you're online for any period of time, it's like, that's what all the gurus and the coaches and the executives are like, be yourself yeah, and authenticity, have your, your lived experience and all this other stuff. Yeah. And I, I'm very cynical about it. I'm not going to get into that. But my point of bringing it up is, is a lot of times executives, companies, and, and other people that are online or in um, these different content marketing channels, they just feel like they have to put on airs or use certain words or like throw in some some terminology that maybe is being used at the time. And, and that's that's totally opposite of what actually works. Like people can, just like a, a salesman at your front door, you can smell when they're desperate. You can smell when people are desperate online too, just by the language that they use and how they present themselves. And so what's fun about what I do um, on in, in the writing business, I guess, is showing people that they don't have to do any of that. They have to tell persuasive stories. They have to sell things through who they are. And a lot of times people are nervous about that because they're they're nervous about the outside noise and what people are going to think about them and how they're going to be perceived rather than this is really who I am and coming to grips with that. Like I, I know that I'm one of the most unprofessional people in the world. I say goofy things on my newsletter. I, I am totally random on LinkedIn. That's just part of who I am. I've come to grips with that. I don't care if they're haters. And a lot of times people will voice that to me and they'll say, this is utter nonsense or this is this is dumb or whatever they end up saying. And of course I push back because I'm snarky and I want to know what they think, but I know that's who I am and and that's what is going to get people to become magnetized to me, at least the my tribe, wherever they are, like they're going to feel that connection to me because I don't pretend. And that's to me, that's the ultimate the ultimate um, goal of using your words wisely and choosing your words that resonate with you is it's going to resonate with other people as, as they get brought into your world. I love that. That's so powerful. And you think about within marketing, we talk about this all the time. The very best marketers and, and the best marketing is education mm -hmm. and storytelling. Yeah. Right. And helping people get where they want to get and letting them be the hero of their journey. Right. As, and, and I, and I love that idea and you have both. Or as you think about, I came from it, you know, education yeah. and now into, into writing and storytelling. Words are powerful too. And in hard times, people need encouragement mm -hmm. and inspiration. Yeah. Where do you go for both Ooh, of those? Man. That's a great question. Um, where do I go for inspiration? I have several books that I dip into throughout the day. Some of them are graphic design oriented. Some of them are copywriting. Some of them are spiritual. Um, but what I like to do is actually just read things out loud to myself. Um, I'm, I'm inspired by a lot of things, but, um, for me, I'm in the writing business because that helps build relationships for people, which lead to other opportunities. Um, and so, like I mentioned before about the doors that just kept opening because I said, yes, I think writing does that for people and building relationships that way. So when you're asking me, where do I go from, for my inspiration? I go to my relationships. I go to my wife. I listen to her. I go to my kids. I listen to them. I go to friends inside, outside of LinkedIn, where I'm a LinkedIn camper officially. I think if anyone knows me or follows me, they know I'm on LinkedIn a lot. Um, so I go there. Um, and, and writing is a relationship business, but it's also a listening business. And so just being able to, to listen to what people have to say, because you'll, you'll be amazed if you actually listen to people or listen just to your world around you and what it's trying to tell you and how that relates to certain projects. Like I've had that happen so many times where I'm in a conversation with someone talking about a totally unrelated, quote unquote, unrelated thing. And I have to pause the conversation and say, I'm so sorry, this is weird. I have to text myself something and I will text myself something. And then later that night at 1030, after all the kids are asleep, I'm on my computer jamming out like I do. And I connect that thought to a project and it's a breakthrough moment. And so well, I have these conversations with people and I find nuggets and I, I search through what other people are saying, the words that they use, and then I tie that into existing clients and things that I'm doing. So, And I love that, that you reach out to relationships and to LinkedIn. Is there someone specific that you would reach out to when you're in the midst of real challenges and why? Um, someone that I would reach out to in real challenges. Uh, I, have, I have several people that act as coaches to me, both on the career and personal front. And sometimes it is just a, a short communication, like a one sentence. What do you think about this? What, you know, what should I be doing? And I'm, I'm a walk and talk. And so I'll call up a friend and I'll just start walking around my neighborhood 
and uh, my my neighborhood is very quiet, and so I'm like the only someone like looks out their window, see Morgan walking by, talking on the phone really loud. But that's um, that's just how I process information, and so I've got I've got copywriters and creative directors that sometimes I'll just pose a question to them, and I'll I'll send them like an Amazon gift card and say thanks so much for answering my question, or if it's uh, if it's a relationship thing, there's people for that, and so I've I've somehow managed to get groups of people around me that whether they'd like to uh, admit it publicly or not, they're sort of on my team. And for these these varying areas of my life, I just go to them and I ask them questions. And I think that's that's something that a lot of people, whether it's due to pride or bad experiences or whatever it is, is they're afraid to reach out and show what they would think to be weakness. I don't think that's weakness to ask for help and to seek that out. Um, I just, I have, come to understand very quickly, especially my adulthood, that I don't have all the answers and I don't know a lot of things. And so that's why I have those people around me is because they they give me the ability to navigate whatever situation I, I come into. And, and what do you observe in those people or a specific person that's oh, overcome challenges I, I that think, helps you through that? I, I think it's just uh, I think it's just humility is they share the same value that I do, that from every single person I come across, I can learn something new from this person and I don't have all the answers. And so it is It is a certain level of humility, but they're all great listeners too. They, they see the value in um, keeping their mouths quiet as, as someone processes something or someone's going through something. And, uh, and, and it's not, when we close these conversations, I've noticed the ending question isn't like, you know, what, what can I do for you? It's like, what are you gonna do now? They always put it back on me. And, and that, that's what I love the best about my friends is that all of us are oriented towards action instead of sitting and wallowing and wondering like, oh my gosh, my life is so bad. What did I do to deserve this? And we all want to move forward. And I think that's what makes them such great advisors or friends or however you want to describe them. That's so solid. I uh, appreciate you sharing that. And, and as you think about, again, back through your, your career and your experience, when were you dealt an absolute lemon in life? <laughs> and and what did you do to get through that? Um, I haven't had too many huge lemons in my life. I know there's a lot of people out there that deal with way worse stuff than I do. Um, growing up, I had a really great life. I had great parents, I had great siblings. I had the grandpa's farm. I mean, I had all the structures in life to have a good life. Um, when, when I got married and Julie and I are progressing through our relationship together with our kids and my career and everything else, I think that the transition from Spanish teacher to writer was was extremely hard. Um, and everybody has the story of, I had seven cents in the bank account and then I managed to get through it, right? We all seen like The Rock and other celebrities tell stories like that, but it was very real for me that um, on the financial level, we were really struggling super hard. And um, I, would, I would scroll all sorts of job sites and try to get extra jobs and um, I, I just thought there's got to be a way for me to make this as a teacher. No one was responding to any of my emails or returning my phone calls. And I just thought, I guess I'm just destined to be a failure. Like, I guess I'm not going to make it. And like Julie made a mistake in marrying me and everything else. I, like you, you start to go down those really, really dark roads in your mind because nothing works, like absolutely nothing works. And then it doesn't help when you look at your bank account and you're like, that's clearly not working, but I'm, I'm like, I must be broken or something. But it was around that time that my wife had a brain surgery. My father-in-law got diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. All of these things kind of came together at one moment during that transition. So I had my personal stuff going on. My wife had her health, her dad had her health, his health stuff. And it just felt like, the entire world crashed. And I just, I didn't know what to do at all. Like I had no idea. Um, and like I mentioned about the the door knocking, it really just came down to, I have to go and try something that's way out of my comfort zone, something I know nothing about, but there's just a piece of me that thinks that it's going to get better if I move to action and I'm, and I have to take a step. And then it just started. I mean, it's not like, Whoa, it all like all got improved right away, but um, just because I took that small step and just like by degrees, it just kept getting better. Julie's health got better. Um, my life in general just got better. And so that was, that was probably, if I had to like pinpoint a moment where it was extremely brutal for me, that was it. I, I thought I was, 
knocked out. I mean, I was down. So yeah. And the fact that you took action, you got up. What advice would you give to someone who's going through tremendous challenges or lemons in their life? Mm -hmm. What would you, what would you tell them? It, it seems counterintuitive, but I think the thing that I would tell those that are going through a huge lemon is just to make friends and be around friends and make, make any effort you can to have lunches or go hang out with people, do activities. Um, it's not that, it's not that I'm saying go out and fake it and pretend that everything's good and, and put on a smile, but it's just being around people. When we go through problems, we want to isolate ourselves. At least I do. And I want to take it on by myself. And I don't want other people to notice that I have issues or I don't want my kids to see that I'm getting angry or whatever my rationale is during those really, really discouraging times. But the, the, for me, what helped out a lot is make more phone calls, um, go to more things with my cousins, do just start doing and, and being more active. That, ha that helped me sort of reorient my mind. Like actually I don't have to be alone. I can, I can go out and still be Morgan that I was before I'm broken Morgan right now, but I can go out and be what I believe to be like the real Morgan, the true Morgan, the Morgan that I want to be after I get through this storm of problems. And that, I think that's, that's what I would say to anybody that's struggling. I think that's awesome. And, and that makes me think about, I love your posts. <laughs> My posts are, on like, it's they're so, polarizing. Yeah, for it's sure. great. But I, it, that made me think about when you were talking about being real, being a friend, you know, what inspired your idea and comment around, I'm looking for real LinkedIn friends. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So I'm, I'm always looking for, um, new ideas on LinkedIn because everybody wants to tell me how they're going to 10 X their marketing plan or like how to be a great leader or like how to communicate. And I just, I, I, and I don't mean to be rude to anybody out there that's posting content like that. All I'm saying is it's so boring. So <laughs> don't, don't, don't make me the mean guy, but it just, it doesn't, it just doesn't entertain. It doesn't educate. It doesn't do anything. So I just look for interesting ideas and thoughts. And I came up with this weird idea that I would make an official post. I'm surprised LinkedIn allowed me to publish it, but literally the title of the job was real LinkedIn friend. And uh, I had 50 applicants in like the first few hours and then I whittled that down to a few people. I did group interviews and then I did smaller group interviews. I, and through that whole thing, I was sending them emails, like an email sequence of um, potential onboarding or like recruitment emails to each of those people. And um, I, it was just a scheme. Like it was just a fun game to play. And um, it when I got on the phone calls with my group interviewees um, that responded, some of them didn't respond and then sent me a DM later like, you didn't pick me for the interview. Like you never responded to my email. So that's why you didn't get picked. I'm not trying to be choosy. Just the people that respond are going to get the email to get on the call with me. Um, but just smiles ear to ear, fun conversations, um, people responding to my emails and to my LinkedIn DMs just saying, this is the funniest thing ever. I loved this. Can we please be real friends? I hope that we're going to be real friends. And um, that's that was my, my impetus was, yes, to have an interesting idea and to have fun with it, but to bring joy and happiness into people's lives. And um, and that that's really why I did it. And just because I'm I'm nuts. That's that's the other reason. It's just I, I like to have fun in, in, in real life, but also on LinkedIn. I just want to be there and not necessarily like, have a humongous audience or a huge community and get the recognition, but just to show people that you can express yourself in this way, it is safe and people are going to like it. I love that. And the fact that we all need more smiles mm -hmm. now today yeah. and, a, and a reason to find happiness and joy in amidst all the challenges of life. Yeah. Because the dial seems to fall on every one of us at some point. It does. Right. And to smile through that and to work through that is awesome. But I thought that was so great. I'm just so curious about what was some of the criteria you, obviously you put some of that criteria. People showed up. It was a simple criteria. It was like, you got to like tacos, rock music, and some other stuff, but. Um, right. And they responded to that. And they responded when you to got that, into yeah. the interviews, what was the further criteria that whittled that group down? Well, what was hilarious is um, on the first round, I had like seven people there on the call and they, they were like no emotion, like very, I could tell that some of them were pretty you nervous. Were nervous for a real life. I even put on my sports coat. I had the t-shirt under, of course, but I had the sports coat on. And I started the interview by saying something along the lines of like, like to welcome everyone to this 
<laughs> real LinkedIn friend interview. Uh, my name's Morgan. I'll be taking us through some questions. And and one of one of the people on that call knew me. And so they're just like busting up, but no one else had ever been on a call with me before. And so they were just shell shocked. And I said, what we're going to do is, is sort of like a round robin. And I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to wait for your answer. And then I'm going to ask the next person. And we'll just go through this and I'll be taking some notes. And I, I asked them all sorts of things from like, just favorite favorite things type questions to what would your coworker say about you behind your back? Like all sorts of questions like that. In about 30 minutes, I sort of broke character and I was like, this was so fun guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> and people are like, what? Like, <laughs> oh no, like we didn't get to ask you any questions. You asked us all the questions. We don't know. Should we be your friend Morgan? Like what do we need? And I'm like, I'm sorry, we don't have time for this. You'll, we'll have to see if you make it to the next round and you know, bye. And, um, it, it was just the, it was so funny. Like it was just a blast. And, um, I think that's why I got the response that I did afterwards was it was just the most hilarious thing that I've done as a professional, like as a, you know, someone trying to interact on LinkedIn with people. But. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I am literally laughing my head off over here. It's so good because think about it. There are probably a lot of people who experience interviews just like that. Yeah. Though. And yes, it's serious to find the right person, mm -hmm. right? But the same thing with the words that you put out and the way that you show up is the type of person you're going to draw in, mm -hmm. right? Into, Absolutely. Into, into, into your friend group. Yeah. And, and I love that. I love, I love how you showed up and just thanks for sharing that because I've been so <laughs> curious and, uh, and, and love that story. So you're working on a new book. I am. I'd yeah. love to hear more about that. And what yeah. you're trying to accomplish. So I, I think um, it, it just ties in directly to the work that I'm doing with leaders and helping them share their stories with the world. Um, since the 90s, we have this term thought leadership that's been floating around the vernacular of, of business people everywhere. And it's like the, the definition basically is we're sharing unique ideas with people and helping them become more familiar with new ideas and proving, basically proving our worth to the world that we're worth engaging with and, and interacting with on the business sense. And I, as I talk to people and do research, my, my website is thoughtleadertoday.com. So I'm very much wrapped up into this idea of thought leadership, but I think the term needs to be shifted because when I discuss it with people, it's like, Oh, thought leadership. Like it's the, everyone is super sarcastic about it because to, to be a real thought leader, you need to have thoughts. That's kind of a prerequisite. And a lot of people posting things and sharing things. It's like, yeah, I've, I've seen that a million times. Like that's not new. Like that's not showing me any new perspective or, or helping me in any way. And so I'm taking that noun and I'm turning it into a verb, thought leader shipping, just the act of, of delivery, content delivery. And so that's what my book is, is all about is showing people things that have worked, things that haven't worked and the shift in how we define that. And so that's, that's what the, the goal of my book is to give executives an opportunity to go across all their marketing channels or just their personal brand, whatever words you want to tie to it and just make it an action because it really is an action. Like people need to get your newsletter. People need to see you on LinkedIn. They need to see you on video. They, they have to get to know you in a, in a variety of ways in order to make effective decisions. And, and the end goal of thought leadershiping is when they get on the call with you, at 80, 85% decision-making mode, basically, they need to go, wow, I already know you. And if they if they have that reaction, they're gonna buy. They're gonna wanna work with you. They're gonna wanna be your your real LinkedIn friend and then eventually work with you to somewhere down the road. And so that's that's what thought leadershiping is is to me. And I'm trying to put my thoughts around it. And a lot of it is writing that I've done. I've, I've done a, a, over a hundred Substack articles in the last year uh, of, of psychology and creativity and thought leadership. And so I want to put them together in a package and just say, here you go, run with it. Before we started recording, we were talking about someone that's very successful. Yeah. Multi-generationally yeah. successful. Sure. And looking for ways to do more. Yeah. Right. And to create more meaning. Mm -hmm. I think that's so interesting too, as we were talking about how do you really add value and be a thought leader in your space rather than just saying more of something, which a lot of people are. Yeah. And they look so successful, but yet they're empty. Tell me about that and, and, and how you really find joy and and what would you say to someone that that may be in that position or is looking for something that may not fulfill 
what they're really looking for. Yeah, I've, I've worked with VCs, attorneys, entrepreneurs, coaches, all sorts of folks from a variety of backgrounds. And on, on the external view, they are the 1%. They are the super mega success story. But on the internal, they don't have a compass. They don't have direction. They're just winging it as much as everybody else is. And I think we know that at some level when we look at social media and and you go on YouTube and you see people blasting you about how great they are and things like that, is there is a lot of there's a lot of output and noise and hey, look at me. This is who I am. I'm so great. I'm so special. But when when you go to the inside of them, they they don't know what their essential truth is. They don't know what their voice is. They don't know what they're supposed to say to an audience. They're just sort of putting things together that they've seen. And yes, that, that gets you to a certain level of success on, on, on the financial piece, but like spiritually or relationship wise or physically, all of those things are discombobulated because they don't have their real purpose. And, but they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And, and, and I, I thought about this last night as I was putting my kids to bed is, um, my, t- my 12 year old was just making me laugh so hard. Like he, I scared him a couple nights ago, really bad as he was going to bed. And he's like, I'm looking around doors and I'm watching for you. And I'm so scared. And we we're just laughing about it because it's not like I put on a Halloween mask every night, try to scare my kids. It's just that one night on accident, I had scared him really bad. And, and he, he and I were just laughing and laughing. And then I go to my next room where the, my three and two year old are, and we're reading Christmas stories and um, and, and talking about biscuit, that dang dog biscuit. We're always reading about him woof woof and in every book and on every page. And anyway, we're laughing and then I go in and it's my girl's room and, uh, they, I've been doing these funny stories with them. And so I, I do that. And so after, after putting all those kids to bed and I, it just kind of hits me in a very powerful way that the work that I'm doing on the inside of my home and on the inside of myself is really what brings me the most happiness and peace and um and joy in life and not what i do at all like it, at the end of the day if i was going to write you know my if i was going to do some somewhat of a eulogy exercise or think about what people are going to say about me at the end of my life like it's not going to be about advertising awards it's not going to be about linkedin follower counts it's going to be my dad loved me he knew i was crazy about roller coasters so he took me to cedar point and we got the VIP and we rode every coaster. It was the greatest thing ever. Or my dad knows that I love ballet. And so he took me to the longest stinking ballet on earth. And my, he sat there for like four hours and listened and watched. And he was there with me and he held my hand. So all those things that we do with our internal, I think internal, but the people that we take care of and the people that we love, that is what... It, that's what sets the stage for effective thought leadership because you know on a very deep level what your why is and what the reasons behind all the things that you're doing across your career and the relationships and the spiritual and, and everything else. And so that's what I hope to accomplish with leaders that I work with is let's just look at everything going on in your life. And let's take an inventory. Let's watch what happens. Um, as we execute on different projects and work together and I get involved with you and you get involved with me and let's, let's link arms and learn together and progress through life on a much deeper level. And, um, hopefully that comes out in the book. Hopefully that comes out with executives that I work with is that they understand that Morgan is not just a writer. He's not just a strategist or he doesn't help me with my brand, but he's trying to help my, my whole life. Like he cares about me. And, um, I know that'll never, that's never, that level of um, caring is never going to come out on social media or other things that I do really. I mean, just in regards to this conversation, I'm bringing it up because it, it just hit me so powerfully last night that you have to have your arms around your internal before you can external, right? And I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's, that's what I thought about. Yeah, that's great. What brings you joy? Oh, man. Um well, Other than that incredible joy. experience you just had with your kids, that was great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised I didn't get emotional there. That was good. Yeah. Good job, Morgan. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what brings me joy is watching people um, kind of remove the blinders from their eyes and see themselves for who they really are, like seeing their real potential, seeing the things that they um, that they want to accomplish in a clear way. Because a lot of us are, when I say a lot of us are struggling, I just think people have a very limited scope and limited view of what they can achieve in their lives. And they go throughout their whole lives they make it to their sixties and they're like, well, 
guess I'm going to retire. Guess this, that was my life. And I, I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but like, that's just the reality is that if you look closely and you listen and you watch people, there's so many that are, are suffering and they're struggling and they don't know where to turn. They don't know what to do and they don't believe in themselves. And so whether it's through my writing or my relationships with people is I exist to help people understand that about themselves. And that's probably what brings me the biggest joy is when I, when I can lift and carry things and do things with my wife and help her have a better life or my kids or my best friends or whatever it is, um, that's what brings me real joy. There's a lot of things that bring me joy. Like I, I love grabbing my guitar and jamming. I love singing. I, I love all of those things that we talked about before. I mean, if there was a pond and you and I were pool wrestling, I'd love throwing you in the pool. Like all those things are still real, but going back to the, the what I consider to be the internal things, those are what brings me joy. And those are the things that I should put most of my time into. And even though the temptation is very strong to focus on all the other things, I just need to remember it's, it's all about the internal. It's all about what's going on in here and with my little world. And if those things are right, then I will have joy and I'll, I'll never lose it. Yeah, love that. Well, rather than our next meeting be at a pond, maybe you bring your guitar and I bring my drums. <laughs> yes, and, I and think we, that'd be much better. <laughs> we do some cool stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. A um, couple lightning round questions for okay. you. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Favorite author? Oh, man. I don't know. Hmm. I'll let you think about that. Favorite book or current book that you're reading right now. Um, I, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I am a, uh, I, I read Spanish science fiction and this is because of my undergrad. I got into a class and the professor, professor Pratt, how are you doing? He said, here's your first book. It's called Mapa del Tiempo and it's 700 pages. And I turned to the guy next to me. I'm like, I've never read anything beyond a poem. Have you? <laughs> and it's like, no, I guess not. So we ended up reading four novels that semester. And that just got me hooked. Like it was the roughest thing that I've ever done. And I was sitting there going, I don't know this word. I don't know this expression. I don't know what he's talking about here. And um, I still have several books on um, my shelf from that class and additional books that I've bought since that time. And that's how I keep up with my Spanish a little bit, I think, is, is just through reading that. And um, there's an author that I read from him. I, I love his stories. He does, he does full scale novels, but he also does short stories, but I, I'm a really big fan of the classics as, as well. Like I love Dracula. I love Les Mis. I love three musketeers. I, all of the things that nobody reads, that's what I read. <laughs> and so, um, I, I tend to focus on, on those classic pieces of literature. And, and of course I have a ton of, um, nonfiction authors that I read from that are just phenomenal, phenomenal writers. And next Thursday, I have a, a workshop that I'm doing on writing, and I'm just going to give away tons of books as part of my way to say thank you. They're in good condition. My wife is like, are you giving away used books? I'm like, they're good. They're still good. You can give them away. Like People will read them. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of like specific names of, of people. Um, one of my favorite copywriters is Dan Nelkin. He's got a great book on copywriting and writing headlines. Um, he's, he's such a, a cool guy on LinkedIn as well, but yeah, there's there. I, I like the classics, I guess, just to bring it full circle. I like the classics. I like Spanish sci-fi and I love learning about how to improve my craft. And so I read a lot of that as well. That's awesome. How can people get in touch with you? Oh man, you can send me a text. Here's my number. Um, <laughs> you can go on my website, thought leader today, or, or just get on LinkedIn. I answer all my DMs and I have no lame away message that says like, I'm a super busy, important person in my inbox is buried. I, I take a lot of care of my inbox. And so if you send me a DM, I will answer unless you're just trying to spam me, which a lot of people do. And, uh, but anyway, that's probably the best, the best way to do it. That's awesome. And I got to ask you, how do you stay on top of that? Do you dedicate time? Yes. Each day? Yes. Yep. Morning and night. I'm on there and I have my routine, my LinkedIn routine. That's really the only platform that I use for social media. So I just have my checklist. I hit my checklist every day. Tell us about your routine really quick. Uh, um, I, I, my, my routine really is I, I kind of warm up my LinkedIn feed. I just answer, I like, I go back and I answer comments um, on previous posts or I have certain people that I go to every day and I will comment or it's just random. Um, and I, I go on there and then I'll make my post and then 
I'll stay for a few minutes extra and answer DMs and things like that. So I, I'll do that at, in, the, in the before I really get into my creative work because I found that between 10 and 12 is like prime hours for my mind to get creative things out or when I just wake up at seven or six or whenever I get up. Kids are always in my bed kicking me, so it's hard to know what time it is at any point of the day. But uh, I, I tend to do that and then I get into creative focus. And then later on when I'm not as creative, late afternoon, I get back on there and see if there's people interacting. And so I, I have my camping spot. Like I said, I am a LinkedIn camper. I will admit it, like can't deny it. I do it in the morning, I do it late afternoon. Yeah, and I think just one follow-up question from that. When you're in the zone, how do you stay in the zone? Let me ask you this. Yeah how do you first get it, you know, get into kind of a flow state and then, and then stay there? Yeah. I, I, the best thing for me as far as getting a flow state is, um, wake, wake up pretty early every morning, exercise, eat the same breakfast. I pretty much eat wheat toast and eggs every day for breakfast. Um, and then I will do somewhat of a meditation. You call it a prayer or whatever it is, but just quiet time to really focus in on what I have to do. And then I, I read for a couple minutes, um, either an inspirational quote or scripture or something like that. And then I just go right into it. I don't do well with music. As soon as I turn on pop punk or jazz or anything, I'm music mode. I'm like gone. Yeah. So I usually do everything in silence because I can't. I, if, if, if there's a song that I know, I'm like singing the song instead of doing my work. So yeah. it's, it's just quiet. You're back to that alto section. <laughs> thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, I don't go back there. Oh man, such a scarring, scarring that's, time. But no, that's awesome, Morgan. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, so thank great you to be here. for the light that you shine in the world and the good that you do. So inspired by your incredible oh, work. And thank you, very nice. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for listening to the Lemonade Stand podcast, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you use to be alerted when we release new episodes. We'd also love to hear your feedback in the reviews. And if you or someone you know has an awesome Lemonade Sound story, please reach out to us on social media and let us know. Thanks so much and have a great day.